James O'Donoghue, we should do more games together. The weather is glorious once more, but this time, Kerry have won. Last time we were in Killarney, they lost to Mayo. This time they've beaten Cork by two points. Jesus, that was close. It was, it was. I think I only do games where it's plus 20 degrees Celsius, but it was a very close game, very entertaining game. Um, first half had absolutely no shape whatsoever to it. When I was looking at it, Kerry had their full forward line, Cork had their full forward line, and the rest of the game was just bodies around the middle. It was hard to know who was picking up who, who was playing where. It was just a case of, we'll shoot, you shoot, using the, a kind of just a random shape. And Kerry kind of built up a bit of a lead, but it was only because of Cork's inability to finish. Their shooting was poor. They created some great chances to slot the ball over the bar and get back and face a kick out, but they dropped them short. They dribbled them wide. They kicked them high and wide. And Kerry were able to then use that to get momentum going the other way and kind of be more clinical. Second half then, at halftime, we were thinking, will Cork come out now and absolutely rattle this, or will Kerry go on and maybe chip a few and, and, and go away with an easy win? But Cork came out all guns blazing. Kerry did not come out of the dressing room at halftime well at all. Cork were really into it. Powder was driving them. Hurley got a mark and two frees. And they brought on Owen McSweeney and Jason Sherlock. Stephen Sherlock. Stephen Sherlock. Sorry, I always have Jason Sherlock in the mind. Hero. Um, and they got some great points from play and they really did rattle Kerry at that stage but the game hinged on one decision and it's going to be a debate all week um, what happened was Powder had the ball in the middle of the field under no pressure really went to pass the ball to, to one of his teammates got turned over at that stage it was 2v2 um, a goal chance for Kerry and Tom Sullivan slipped Paul Ganey in just in the 15 attacking slot and I think the Ganey saw Powder, and this is the kind of the intelligence of a player at times. I think the Ganey saw Powder, and he he kind of thought that this man physically is is smaller than me. I can go around him for the goal chance, and he could have also thought that Powder was the one who was after giving away the ball in the first place, because because Powder gave away the ball, Powder was in a state of I need to stop this attack. I can't let this go in the back of the net because I'm the one who's after making the mistake. So he has to, to stop the ball some way. And I think that all this is going through Ganey's head. He tries to go around Potter. Potter brings him down. And as soon as Ganey hits the deck, he's up and he's in Goff's ear saying, I was going to score a goal. What are you going to do? And he, he planted the seed in Goff's head. And the rule is that if you stop a goal scoring opportunity inside of 21, it's a black card and a penalty. So Goff went to the, to the umpires and they decided black card and a penalty I mean unbelievably harsh but that is the rule speaking to John Cleary afterwards he, he had questions about it he thought it was very harsh he was like it would have been a hell of a goal and we're looking at a screenshot here of the moment where Powder makes contact with Ganey now yeah. Cleary and the Cork team contend that they had a man covering O'Mahony and O'Driscoll are behind Paul Ganey about three yards behind at that time do you think Ganey is scoring a goal here against Michal Martin from that angle I think I think that Paddy Clifford's probably scoring a goal there if I'm being honest I think that Ganey will if he gets past Powder there he's getting just outside um, the six yard box and he's probably flicking it across the square because I think that Brian O'Driscoll is going more towards Ganey there mm. and I think the ball is onto the back post for a tap in or Ganey could easily get past Powder and open his body and put it to the keeper's left and into the far corner so Look, it's hypothetical because he brought him down. It's semantics, yeah. Does any other referee in the country, apart from David Goff, give that? <laughs> well, what I would say is I credit Paul Ganey because he was he showed good game smarts there. You know, like at that stage, even if he gets a free, and it's a, a tap over point, you know, it's a good score to get from a breakaway and a possible black card anyway. So the fact he got up and put the the idea in Goff's head. Do you think he said it to Goff? I think that no doubt he definitely said... Because you didn't know what the bloody rule was. Most people in the press box didn't know what the bloody rule was. I didn't know, I just said I'd forgotten. <laughs> but the rule hasn't been used. I think that's the first time that rule has been... I remember it was, it was given in a hurling championship match, I think it was yeah, last James year. James roars out, it's not hurling! <laughs> but there was pandemonium because it, it was so harsh. But, yeah. I mean, that is a goal-scoring opportunity. So, look, it's in black and white. It's yeah. a very harsh decision. If you're on the receiving end of it, you're giving out. If you're on the... If you're the one that benefits from it, you're kind of saying, look, it's, it's in the rules. So. It's nearly like the incident in the, in the Hurling Championship a couple of years ago when, uh, was it, was it uh, Tip and Clare? 
and uh, cutting in from the sideline inside yeah, the 21 the one, yeah. and the penalty. Yeah, yeah. yeah no, that was that controversial. Was, this this wasn't as controversial, I would say. That one was was very far away from the goals. I mean, this one is literally yeah. inside the 14. Okay. He's bearing down on goal. So it'll be a 50-50 debate, but... Okay. That, that's the key moment. It's the 45th minute. Cork had just come out after the break, as you said. They kicked four of the first five points in the half. After the 45th minute, no other Kerry player scores until Tom O'Sullivan pops over a point in injury time, apart from David Clifford. He kicks one three in the second half. What happened to Kerry? That's a good question. Uh, there's something There's something just not right with Kerry at the moment. The, the only spell, really, they had of kind of intense pressure on Cork was in the first half the first 20 minutes Shawnee Shea was really to the fore got two or three from play same with David and Paddy Clifford they got their points from play but then it, it was almost a case of in the second half a little bit of the concentration went and there was nobody individually driving it on driving it on and really do you know when a team is going well you can hear them all encouraging each other and you can hear them say more 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 everyone just went a little bit quiet and into, their, into themselves and they let Cork build up that momentum and when the Cork crowd gets behind their team Cork are incredibly dangerous and it can be a lonely enough place out there like, just like playing Dublin and Crow Park when the, the crow gets behind them you're on the back foot and you just need one or two to chip in with those important points and Tom Sullivan did get a great score to just to settle them down but you're right Kerry going forward in attack they, there's just something missing at the moment um, I was is it an attack though? Because Cork kind of dominated the middle third in that second half. And even a man down, Cork still got a handle on the game. Well, at that stage, Kerry were after weathering the storm. So Cork came out at half time and they, got, they went from 9 4 to 10 9 down. And then the, the penalty decision. So Kerry were kind of on the ropes at that stage. They needed, they needed something to, to go their way. I think it is up front. I think that if your if your forwards are being more incisive, they're kicking more points in play. Everyone is just is just feeling better about themselves. When the ball is being turned over up front, it's coming down the other end, and it's wave after wave after wave. No matter how good your defence is, eventually they're going to get back there. The only thing I will say is that Kerry did look fairly clinical. They don't they kick many wides, as opposed to Cork. Mm. Many of the chances Cork got in front of goals. They just they put in some really bad efforts, and if I could say anything about Cork improving, and if they improve again against Mayo, they'll rattle Mayo, no doubt about it. They need to get better shooters on the field because you can't be doing all that running, running, running to go up the field and kick it wide, and that is the story. Look, that's that is GA at the moment. Strength and conditioning is so important that you don't have these great kickers anymore. Every time Clifford kicks a point, we're ooing and eyeing because it's so rare. And I was thinking back to Kerry Corkes. Remember Colin Corkery, Dunnock O'Connor, Daniel Goulding, Colm O'Neill. These fellas, they'd kick, as Paddy Andrews called them, spinners from anywhere. Or they'd kick worldly points. And that is really going out of the game at the moment. If Cork could just focus on kicking from a little bit further out, like Sherlock did and Sweeney did in the second half, I think that would be a huge improvement for them. Like, let's just talk about that now, because McSweeney and Sherlock come in after the 47 minutes. They kick two points from play each. Sherlock had the free as well. Four beauties from play. And Cork in the first half had a lot of the ball, but attacks kept breaking down. Yeah. Was it that they, they didn't have enough shooters? Or they're just not backing themselves? Like Kerry were just moving the ball so fast and they turned them over and they were getting scores on the other end. I put it clearly after the game, why didn't Sherlock start? Was it like the Monaghan decision a couple of weeks ago against, or last week against Derry? They dropped McManus and McCarran and bring in two runners. He said that he wanted to finish with... Uh, a strong team a stronger team strong shooters which is fair in a way but what do you think? That is the party line when you drop someone you say look we want to have him on the bench to, to finish strong look it is a thing where you have your finishers you have strong players to come on absolutely but <laughs> if Cork had thrown over one or two extra ones in the first half it would have made a huge difference but the way Cork were attacking down in this end in the first half they were hand passing hand passing breaking lines getting runners off it was all brilliant and it was lovely all right, all very incisive but Kerry physically were so strong Jack Barry stood up and turned people over Darren Moynihan Gavin White had a great turnover and you could see Jason Foley and a couple more just get life from that and they celebrated those turnovers and that allowed Kerry to counter attack whereas if Cork were just a bit cuter they, they could still do the incision and their lines but just have a couple of shooters hang out by the 45 they'd have got a shot off eventually but they just don't have those kickers on the field so we kind of had this debate 
a separate debate at the weekend. We didn't really get into it in the football pod about the entertainment value in football at the minute. Mm-hmm. Like, how do we convince managers to bring more forwards in, more shooters? Is it a, is it a trust thing? Is it trust? I suppose the way the way that a lot of managers see it is you're either you're either no no forward or you're a defender basically. Do you know, like they want as many defensive minded players on the field as possible and very often you can't fit in a player like Sherlock because he won't get in ahead of Hurley and maybe he won't work as hard as other fellas. Which is fair, you have to get the mix right in this day and age you have to be a very good defensive player as well as an attacking player if you're going to play corner forward. All the dubs talk about how Bernard Brogan changed that in his game when, when he was questioned on it. So I think that, that that is certainly a very important part of being a corner forward at the moment, getting back and tackling. But there is no point in being the best in the gym, the best in the runs, and you get in front of the goal and you kick it wide. Like, strength and conditioning coaches are one at the forefront of GA at the moment, and they have a huge place, but there has to be a better balance with the skills because at the moment any point that goes over we are saying that was absolutely fantastic but back in the day there was 20 of those a piece nearly going over the bar Do you know like it, it was it was a lot it was a lot more skillful in terms of in terms of shot taking at the moment we're kind of lagging behind in that area is there, is there anything we can do to change that is there anything the way we can incentivize it is it like is it just are we lost is the corner forward a lost a lost breed? No, I don't, I don't think so. I don't think. Would there have been another year in James O'Donoghue? <laughs> well, what are you saying about my defence? <laughs> um, I don't think there's anything to be done about it. It's just a case of of it coming back around yeah. again. Yeah. At the moment, yeah. the focus <laughs> is on like when strength and conditioning came in first. It was like I'm not I'm not doing that. Mm. that, that that's well, I don't need to be doing the gym or whatever and you realise I do need to be doing that I don't need to be that fit you do need to be that fit and now it's kind of just forgotten a little bit of how important long range shooting is and shooting from plays because the, the other stuff will only get you so far it'll come back around again but I think the manager should really focus on it that lack of incision and attack aside Cork got so many things right today we, we kind of dismissed you a little bit on the football pod Paddy in particular saying oh Jimmy pulling out the Cork line again you were worried coming down here were you worried 10 minutes into the second half 20 minutes into the second half I don't think that I ever got worried necessarily I think the Kerry were were value for their victory but that said there's something in Cork they have something inside them where they can go and seriously pull out a big result so you're always a little bit tentative about, about Cork and I always say Kerry need Cork Kerry need Cork to be as good as they can be to test Kerry and improve Kerry and so we can have great days like today in Killarney and in Parky Cueve I said that Cork were going to be the team to watch at the start of the year well I picked, I picked someone different mm. I said they'd be the team to watch because they were on this curve and they've got Cleary in charge and I have great time for John Cleary I think he's a good manager they have some excellent forwards they're just probably not kicked on as fast as I thought they would but you can see the structure they have actually works quite well yeah. if they can just get the finishers on the field and in fairness to Hurley, I thought he played very well today, but he's only coming back from a, from a big injury. So I, they'll, they'll definitely improve as the year goes on. And if they, they'll rattle Mayo, they, there's no doubt about Do it. Do you think, yeah? They'll put, in a, they'll put in a shift against Mayo. Whether they'll win or not, I don't know. But regardless, they should come third in the group, which means they'll have a, a prelim game away, fair enough, against a second-place team in another group. And I wouldn't back against them in one of those games. Jeez, if Cork get another team here in Parky Cueve, it might just give people a look. Like, it's absolutely delightful we're one of the last here now at the minute but like the noise here James once it got going yeah. was something else and the Cork crowd were really really behind this team they applauded them off at the end at the end of the game and like the Kerry lads ran as quick as they could I think they were just happy to get out with their two points Cork football like how far away is it really do you think I don't know it's, a, it's hard to say on, on a, on a once off game and the Cork haven't been shown that much on on television this year we haven't actually yeah. seen that much of them to be fair from seeing them today they're not far away and it's great to see the supporters behind them because I've been involved in, in games against Cork where you could tell that the relationship between the, the team and the and the supporters was was fractured so the fact that maybe the Cork public can see geez we can get behind this team that does put something positive into the into Cork players uh, heads because they need that support any team need that support 
once the and I think it's a lot to do with the manager I, a couple of the managers I have with Kerry were really good at getting the public on side with the team you know, especially in, in difficult periods you need that support how would they do that? in speaking to, to people like you in interviews and things like that where you just say look this team is coming we're trying this we're trying that we need you do you know you're part of this journey with us like all oh, that kind of stuff and maybe releasing the players to the media a bit more and, and letting them do you know become mm. part of the whole scene I think that's very important because otherwise if there's a disconnect and the team is going badly there's no feel good factor in the county and I know for a fact that was the case in Cork for a while it doesn't seem to be the case anymore and the fact they were clapped off is a good sign but what I will say is there's only so many times that you can nearly beat your arch rivals and I've been there with Dublin and with other teams even at club level you're like, oh, no. so you need to then get over the line and beat them so the next time Kerry play Cork I think that there's going to be pressure on Cork to actually get the result and not just the performance Forgive me now because I actually can't remember it but what was your view of the Mark Keane goal in 2020? Were you, where were you? I was at home you were injured, weren't you? Yeah, I had a hamstring injury. I was due to come back. I was due to come back for the the Tuesday night after it, and I was watching it at home. Yeah, with um, Jonathan Lyne. I think we were both. No, was Jonathan Lyne still in the panel? That's it was it. during COVID, so there were. It was during COVID, yeah, so we couldn't go to the game, and we were get, honestly getting ready for for um, a big week, and ball dropped into the square. Luke Connolly went for a point. Luke Conley and I always say that is the best way to score a goal is to take an old awkward shot the you drop do. shot you do say that um, and sure enough and I think Kerry did everything right that time we had uh, tall players in our own defence and looked uh, just yeah. a struck luck but was, sometimes you can earn that luck and they, they did there was just a moment and we had the view here of Matty Taylor bombing that ball in and there was no marking today so no. the, it, it, it was the 72nd minute. I think Shane Ryan actually came out and got a fist to it yeah. But there was just a moment as that ball was in the air, you were like, oh, is this happening again? Mm. Yeah. You see, if you don't pull away from a team, there's always that chance. You know, you need to be, you need to be constantly tipping over on the scoreboard. Get one, one or two extra points can make such a difference yeah. to, to make a team go for a, a goal at the end rather than go for a point. And in fairness to Shane Ryan, he dealt very well with that. And that's, that's the benefit of having <coughs> probably an out and out brilliant goalie that everyone else just has to box out their man. And Shane came up and, and, yeah. and dealt with it. So kudos to him for doing that under pressure. This week on the Football Pod with Paddy Andrews and yourself, we'll talk about what you want to see from Kerry next time out. I'm going to let you go now. You're going to make it back to Killarney this evening. Your dad came to the game with you today, so we'll let you hit the road. Will we, be, will we be a bit more upbeat this Monday? We were a bit down on football last week on the pod. I don't know whether we were all hungover or something or the hay fever was getting all three of us, but I, th- I thought we were a bit downbeat last week. Like There's 16 games this weekend. Can we uh, tell the listeners there'll be a bit more excitement? I think there, there, well, there was excitement today, wasn't there? Was, there was. was. Um, after Ross Common put on a clinic, as you said uh, <laughs> last week. I did say it. <laughs> um, I think that today was an excellent game. It was up and down the field, very entertaining. Any, any, any attack usually resulted in either a turnover mm. or a shot at the post relatively quickly. We weren't waiting and waiting and waiting, hand passing laterally. I think that that is very important for the game, that we can actually look at attacking play. So 100% will be more positive. Um, and uh, as well, what people don't realise is there's a lot of different levels playing each other at the moment in this competition. Whereas the best football is going to be played when the best eight teams and the best four teams and the best two are there. Those games, those quarterfinal, semifinal, final games are going to be the pick of the games. It's all being set up. That's why there's three, well, the reason there's three through is to stop the dead rubbers. But with three through, there's going to be no big surprise of a team missing out. So the, the big eight, when they start playing each other, that's when the real quality is going to kick in, I think. Yeah. So we have, we have that to look forward to. Great stuff, James. Enjoy today. Safe home. Thanks, Tom. See you soon.